Oh, yeah. Yes. It's, uh, Perfect. It's uh, best known by his work at the All right, so hi everyone. So <clears throat> my name is Olivier. Uh, so I, I, I'm uh, one of the scikit-learn maintainers. I work at uh, INRIA and uh, my work is supported by uh, la Fondation INRIA with uh, uh, a bunch of uh, partners. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to, to them all. And uh, the talk today is to, uh, to uh, talk a bit about uh, First, introduce Scikit-Learn and then highlight some new uh, things that were introduced in the last release, O21, in particular gradient boosting, uh, the new implementation. Uh, I, will, I will give a demo and uh, I won't have time to go into details with other new stuff, uh, but uh, there are more details in the slides and, and uh, I already tweeted them, so at the end you, you will see the link. So Scikit-Learn is a machine learning library. So. Uh, the goal is to make prediction on the outcome of uh, repeated events uh, by extracting, extracting the, the structure of the historical records uh, collected in the database. And we use statistical tools uh, to summarize basically uh, an aggregation of the training data uh, and to turn it into an executable model that you can then deploy on, on other computers or mobile phones. Uh, so you can think about machine learning as an alternative to hard-coded uh, rules written by experts that know exactly how the, the data is generated from. Here we do not necessarily know the process that generate the data, so we, we just try to find statistical regularities to, to, to make a uh, predictive model. So it's suitable to compute many small predictions in cases where if you make an individual error, it doesn't, it's not such a big problem. Uh, as long as, on, on average, uh, you're, you're making good, uh, good uh, predictions. Um, <clears throat> so do not use machine learning for critical <laughs> uh, decision making. Um, so the, the typical workflow is to start from the, the raw data that can be collect, uh, acquired uh, by sensors, uh, video cameras, uh, microphones, or, or user behaviors interacting with a mobile application or web application. You record the event in the database, and uh, so the blue lines are the records, and the green column is typically the, the, the variable of interest. Sometimes you have to annotate your data to have those, this green column, like for instance for image classification you might need to, to use human annotations to know uh, uh, what this image is about. Other times you just uh, have the information already in the, in the past transactions. And once you have this, uh, you, you can uh, use a, a machine learning algorithm to output a statistical model. So it, it needs to be turned into some kind of number, the data needs to be turned into a numerical representation, and then you can apply a, generatic, a generating, uh, generic uh, learning algorithm uh, to deal with your data. Once you have this statistical model, you can uh, use it for the prediction algorithm. So the prediction algorithm takes the parameter of the statistical model as an input and the, uh, another test record that you want to classify or to regress. And you get the, the predicted label as an outcome uh, and sometimes with some kind of uh, confidence label. Uh, in practice, once you've fitted the statistical model, you can deploy it. You don't necessarily need to keep a reference to the original data. Uh, because the statistical model is a summary, an aggregate, that will uh, only preserve the, the interesting, uh, repeatable part of, of the data. So Scikit-Learn is a library with hundreds of, uh, of machine learning algorithms. Uh, uh, we focus on classical algorithms that are good baselines, uh, that have been known for a while and we know that they are useful. Uh, we do not necessarily uh, implement the latest uh, uh, state-of-the-art of machine learning research. We leave that to other research libraries. Um, <clears throat> and the goal is to provide a good baseline like for data scientists. Um, it's, it's open source, meaning uh, we use a BSD license, so it can be used both in business scientific applications. So there is no constraints. It just don't have any guarantee or uh, by default. 
there is a community of hundreds of contributors per release. We do uh, one release every six months or to one year approximately. There is a core developer team that is scattered around the world. So it's a very uh, a community project with uh, core developers in Australia, in China, in France, in Germany, in the USA. Um, it's implemented in Python and Cyton, which is a, um, an extension to Python to have uh, uh, compiled extensions. And we also rely a lot on uh, building blocks of the ecosystem, such as NumPy and SciPy, for linear algebra and optimization and array manipulation. So the, the main uh, value of Scikit-Learn is to try to provide some kind of homogeneous, simple API with the fit, predict, and transform method uh, that will uh, present the that will expose uh, many kinds of different mathematical algorithm under the same homogeneous API. Basically. Uh, we also provide additional tools for model evaluation, like cross-validation, uh, selection of the best hyperparameters, and how to build ensembles of different models to combine their predictive power together. Uh, so, uh, actually, this number should be probably updated, uh, but I think there are uh, nowadays 800,000 uh, um, unique visitors uh, reading the documentation uh, online. So we are moving slowly toward 1 million. Uh, basically, the user base is doubling every two years. Uh, this is what we observed. So <clears throat> what is new in Scikit-Learn 021 that was released uh, uh, just before last summer? Uh, <coughs> plenty of, this, of things. So this is just uh, uh, three uh, screenshots of, uh, of the change log. And actually, uh, if you scroll down on the change log, you could cover the wall. <laughs> Over, over there. Uh, so we just focus on one single point, uh, which uh, is uh, something that I've been involved with particularly, uh, which is the uh, new implementation of the gradient boosting uh, algorithm. So it started uh, last year uh, in, in the summer. Uh, I decided to try to experiment with Numba because I was kind of curious and to re-implement a classical paper, uh, which is the LightGBM uh, paper, which provides a much more efficient uh, implementation of the gradient boosting algorithm than the one that was already present in Scikit-Learn. In Scikit-Learn, we had an old uh, classical implementation of the exact canonical algorithm, and LightGBM uh, was released uh, after XGBoost a couple of years uh, later, uh, and implemented an approximate version based on histograms that in practice was as accurate as the, as the original one, but significantly more scalable, like it would be orders of magnitude uh, um, faster on large datasets. Uh, so we, I, I thought that Scikit-Learn really needed something like this. So initially, I, I just wanted to, to familiarize myself with Numba, so I started to prototype it uh, as an inter uh, independent project called PyGBM. And later, when we thought that we, it was working, uh, I collaborated uh, with uh, Nicolas Hugues Hug at the uh, University of Columbia, who is also one of the core developers of, uh, of the project, and uh, Adrien Jalali uh, in Anaconda, to turn this into something that we can uh, ship as part of Scikit-Learn. So to do this, we decided not to introduce an independency uh, in, in the Scikit-Learn project. So we translated the number code into Cyton, so that requires additional verbosity. But the, the main code is still uh, approximately the same, and if you prefer the number version, it's still, uh, it's still online. Uh, so it's very nice because uh, it implements uh, the high-performance tricks of LightGBM. Uh, so uh, we can get a, a really scalable implementation of gradient boosting now in Scikit-Learn. So just to give you a, a feeling of what the code looks like when you write with Numba, so this is the code that does the, the binning of, of the data. So it, it will convert continuous variables uh, into a discrete uh, list of uh, integers uh, with, with different uh, binning thresholds that have been pre-computed before. So this is uh, something that is very simple. It's just a uh, dichotomy, you look for uh, the, the, the right bin in a list of ordered bin, bins. And so this is the naive way to, to write the algorithm in Python. Uh, but if you do that in Python, you, have, you see that you have nested uh, loops, like you have a for loop and a while loop. Um, so this is really inefficient because of uh, the, the design of Python, which is an interpreted programming language. So if we want to get native code with a uh, number, what you just need to do is uh, this ngit uh, compiler uh, declaration, and this is actually the code that is running in PyGBM and is as fast as the C++ version uh, of uh, LightGBM. Uh, 
uh, the only uh, thing to make it as uh, as scalable as a light GBM uh, is to make it uh, run on many threads uh, if you have many cores on your CPU. So there is a second change that you can do is to replace the range loop the, in the for loop, the, the range uh, operator, by a P range from number, and then you get for free uh, the parallelism for, for, for this loop and you can use all the cores of your machine. So this is actually the code that I wrote in, in, in PyGBM and it, you see it's much simpler than a typical uh, C++ code, at least for data scientists it's much more re readable because it looks like Python, it's, it's exactly like Python, but it's as fast as, as C++. And so that's a, I think it brings a lot of value uh, to the project. Uh, in practice, for scikit-learn, we had to convert it to Cyton. So there are additional type declarations uh, on top of this, but the, the, the feeling stays approximately the same. So uh, now we have the, the Cyton implementation uh, uh, directly in the scikit-learn release. So it's still flagged as experimental because uh, we still have new features that we want to implement. And we know that the APIs might change a bit, and we don't want, do not want to, uh, to be uh, constrained by a, a backward compatibility for the, the coming two or three releases. So there is this uh, experimental uh, acknowledgement that you need to, to put before in, uh, import, uh, importing uh, this uh, model. But it's already fully functional. You can use it in production. It's just the day where, when you upgrade scikit-learn, you might be aware that this specific model might need the, uh, additional work uh, when you, you upgrade to change the hyperparameters or the declarations. Stuff like so, it supports classification and regression with early stopping, uh, with a couple of losses. There are many losses that we could add, uh, add uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, quantile regression or additional things like this. We are missing uh, some features in the last release, but some of them are already implemented in, in master, like for instance the support for missing values and sample weights that are being currently implemented. And uh, we still lack support for categorical variables, sparse data, and uh, larger binning. Maybe we will do it, but I don't know. Um, <coughs> So I think that's it. Uh, yeah, and uh, from a performance point of view, this is what you observe uh, when uh, when you scale the number of samples on the x-axis. So yeah, it's between 100,000 data points, one million, and then 10 million or more. Uh, you see uh, that uh, scikit-learn is the blue line. It follows, it tracks a light GBM quite closely. Sometimes it's faster, a uh, tiny faster. <laughs> And uh, XGBoost is the green line, and at the time when we did the benchmark, uh, XGBoost was significantly uh, slower because it's a lower logarithmic axis. Uh, but apparently in the master uh, version of XGBoost, uh, it was optimized uh, significantly by Intel engineers, so now I think it's as fast or maybe a bit faster. But uh, the main point is that scikit-learn now has a fast implementation of gradient boosting directly in, in the library. So I would like to switch to... Um, some interactive demo. Uh, so how do we do that? Yeah. So this is a notebook that I prepared to, to give you a feeling on what is gradient boosting, how to use it, and uh, what does it bring in, in, a, in a typical data science workflow. So I will use a traditional uh, uh, data set, which is uh, the California housing regression problem. So the goal is to um, uh, predict the price of houses uh, in California. I think it was collected in the 90s or something like this. So you have these features uh, uh, for different neighborhoods in, in California, the median, median income, the, the average uh, age of the houses, the average number of rooms, uh, number of bedrooms, the population density, and so on, and the location in, uh, in 2D space in, on GPS uh, coordinate. And uh, based on, on this uh, 20,000 records, uh, you need to build a model to uh, estimate the price of the house in a new location with a new context, in a new environment. Um, so first, uh, we, we can uh, split our data set into a training and test set at random. So we just keep 1,000 data points for evaluation. And uh, we will start with some baseline. So the simplest baseline that you can think of is ordinary least squares. Uh, if you do that uh, in scikit-learn, it's very fast, 8 milliseconds to fit. 
and you can compute the uh, the mean uh, the median uh, absolute error and you see that you have a 0.4 something on the, on the test set and uh, approximately the same on the training set which means that the model is completely underfitting it's not powerful enough uh, and you can also have a look at re residual plots here it's not a residual plot it's uh, uh, I'm plotting on the x-axis the prediction and the y-axis the true target the expected outcome uh, so those are prices in, I don't know, uh, tens of uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, and you see something that is really bad here is that there is some structure in, 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 uh, in this plot, which means that uh, the, the, uh, the loss function of the model is not uh, matching the, the probability of the outcome. And there is also this uh, censoring effect here in the true target. Uh, that is a, an artifact of the collection of the acquisition process of the training set. Uh, so we have, we have to deal with it and the model needs to be robust to that to, to make good prediction. So because we, there is this uh, coma shape uh, thing in, in, in our predictions, it means that uh, the model do, do not really uh, expect this kind of uh, predicted outcome and if we look at the histogram of, of the, the, the values that we need to predict on the training set, you see that it's not a Gaussian distributed thing. There is a long tail, it's skewed on the right, and there is also this uh, censoring effect. So maybe if we can reshape it to make it more like uh, a Gaussian distribution by taking a log, that will help the problem, uh, uh, the, the model. So in scikit-learn, since the two releases now, there is this uh, transform target regressor that makes it possible to wrap your linear regression model with a function that takes the log before fitting the model and the exponential uh, after predicting so that you can still predict in the, in the same space. So we, did, we do a pipeline by standardizing and, and, and we do that. And let's see if that helps the model uh, make better prediction. If we do this, you see that the test score has gone from 41 to 36, so it's, uh, the error has, uh, has decreased. And if we look at the, the predictions, uh, they, they look more on the diagonal. If they, are, if they were completely uh, on the diagonal, that would, be, uh, that would mean that we would have a, a perfect model. So it's a slight improvement, but uh, still the model is underfitting. You can see that uh, the train error is still uh, very high. So let's give some more flexibility to the model by taking a nonlinear decision function by just doing some feature engineering. So we can do a polynomial feature extraction and we insert this as a feature engineering step in, in the pipeline between the, the standardization and, uh, and uh, the regression step. So let's try this. It takes more time because uh, it's creating many more dimensions. But in the end, we see that we are starting to get some uh, lower, uh, uh, lower uh, scores and the model is starting to uh, overfit a bit, but not too much yet. Uh, and if we look at the, uh, the predictions, they are getting more and more on the diagonal. So I could have tried to train a, a, a neural network and actually you can get slightly better accuracy, but it's taking one or two minutes, so I don't want to do that during the demo. Uh, but even better than a, a neural network, we can use uh, decision trees algorithms that tends to work well on this kind of uh, tabular data set. So here is the random forest regressor with 100 trees in the, in the forest. And uh, I use two threads uh, on my laptop to, to, to fit it. So it takes a bit more time because it's a more complex model, but uh, in six seconds, uh, I have a model. And now the, the error is below 0.2, so it's uh, significantly faster. Uh, look at the predictions, you see it's more and more on the diagonal, there are less, uh, uh, the number of outliers, of diagonal outliers is decreasing significantly. The problem with random forest is very popular, very easy to use, but uh, in general that yields very big models, like this model, just uh, for this small data set, has created trees, uh, in, uh, 100 trees, in total they take 100 uh, 50 megabytes in memory, so if you want to deploy that on a mobile, mobile phone that might be a problem. Uh, furthermore, uh, to, to make some predictions, so here I'm just making prediction on a test set with 1000 uh, records, uh, you see that uh, it's not that fast, so it takes uh, 147 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds uh, just for 1000 uh, predictions. So it, it might be uh, a latency issue. So an alternative is to use the gradient boosted trees so, and especially the new implementation histogram of uh, the histogram version. So 
the same imported statement as previously. If I fit it, it's uh, slightly faster than the random forest and it's even more scalable, so three seconds. And it's even better, like uh, the, the accuracy, the test score, I think is the best that I have observed on, on this data set. And uh, you see that I'm just using the, uh, almost the default hyperparameters. You can tune them, but uh, honestly, the default ones, they tend to work, uh, to give you a good baseline. And uh, the, the, the predictions are more and more diagonal, uh, fewer and fewer outliers. And what more is, uh, even more interesting is that the, the model is almost 100 times smaller than the random forest and uh, significantly faster to predict. So it's a, a really uh, big bonus if you, if you want to deploy in production. Uh, there are additional things like the ability to do uh, early stopping. So instead of training 100 trees, you can uh, train the trees sequentially and monitor the validation score. And as soon as the validation score does not increase anymore, you stop. And so here, uh, you see that actually you need, uh, uh, it's, it's better to add more trees. Uh, but uh, basically, you have an automatic tuning on the, on the number of trees uh, based on, on the validation loss. So here's a, a negative loss, so it increases. But you see that at some point the, the validation loss is getting flat. The training loss will go to zero at some point. But uh, here you can stop because you're not making any progress anymore. And so you have an automated way to, to stop the algorithm to keep a, a small model that predicts fast. So I think I will stop here for, for the demo. Uh, yeah, just one, one more point. Uh, there, there is... Um, a tool which is called partial dependency plot in scikit-learn that makes it possible to get an insight on how different impact, uh, different variables impact the, the decision function. It's very efficient for this, this, uh, decision tree models. So uh, uh, it's directly implemented in scikit-learn. So for instance, here we see that the median income has a linear impact on the, on the target uh, variable, whereas the average occupancy of the houses in the neighborhood uh, as this kind of saturating effect, so it's a non-linear marginal um, impact. Uh, the house hedge alone has very little impact. You see there is a slight positive trend, but it's not very Im important. Uh, the average number of rooms uh, are the, the, the same, but if you combine uh, the house hedge and the average occupancy together, you see that you have this non-negative interaction between the two variables. Here you have uh, some, some kind of effect, which means that when the two are above, the average occupancy is below some threshold and the house edge is above some threshold, there is a very large positive impact on, on the outcome. So it, it gives you some insight on what the model has discovered in the data. And it's very fast to compute, so, so have a look. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go back to the slide. Um, so I will skip uh, the old version. I just want uh, s uh, some uh, closing words. So also during the last iteration, we d we made a lot of effort to, to contribute to the up upstream ecosystem of Python. We did some work on uh, multiprocessing, uh, parallel computation, and we had the opportunity to fix many uh, bugs uh, uh, in, in the standard libraries, the causes of deadlocks. And so we had a backport for, for scikit-learn, but it's also included now in uh, Python 3.7 and 3.8. And uh, actually, uh, Pierre, we're going to talk a bit more about this. And uh, we also had the opportunity to uh, 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 accelerate the, the shipping of NumPy arrays on, on cluster when you do distributed computing, for instance, with Spark or with Dask. Um, and so the, this is like a, uh, infrastructure work that is also very important for scikit-learn. And so it, it's good if we have fa financial support to, to work on the long term on scikit-learn because then you can also uh, invest more in uh, fixing uh, upstream bugs that uh, otherwise nobody would be interested in fixing them. Um, so I just want to thank you again, the, the, the partners. Thank you, the community. Uh, so those were scikit learn Sprint uh, in Paris uh, in, the, in the diagonal, a Sprint in Austin, in SciPy in Austin last year, and a Sprint in New York uh, with the uh, women in machine learning and data science. So that's a very, uh, very nice to, uh, community to, to work with. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Olivier. We have time for some questions. Um, anyone? Questions? Actually, I have a couple. Yeah. Like uh, you said, you supported early stopping mm -hmm. in, in, 
it, you say it's implemented through a validation set. How do mm. you pass that validation set? So right now it's a bit uh, limitation. So the validation set is extracted automatically uh, by uh, random sampling using a test test split, a train test split. Uh, maybe there is some stratification uh, for classification. Uh, there is some discussion on, on how to, to make it such that you can pass an arbitrary validation set with your own splitting strategy, uh, but I think it's not yet implemented. Uh, and another, uh, there's a, anyone else with a question? I will ask <laughs> okay. again. Uh, so, uh, if I understood correctly, it's a re-implementation of like GVM or it's based on a different uh, papers? Or, uh, uh, so it's mostly the, the strategy that is implemented in LightGBM. So, and actually, XGBoost now is doing the same. Like they, they also have the histogram-based uh, version of LightGBM, which is apparently what the, the fastest thing that you can do on a single machine. LightGBM has additional uh, tricks. If you want to run a very, very large data sets with a lot of redundant information, uh, there is an optimization that we haven't implemented in scikit-learn. In practice, I, it wasn't that beneficial in the benchmark that I did, but maybe on very large data set it is important. It has also optimizations for uh, very sparse data uh, in a high dimensional data, and this is not uh, yet implemented in scikit-learn, it's more like a, an advanced feature of like GBM. Uh, and also something else that is very interesting in, in uh, LightGBM is the ability to, to distribute the computation. So you can partition your data set on a cluster and have local LightGBM workers who, who will uh, propose candidate splits on, on their own partitions and vote together. And it's a very efficient way to distribute uh, gradient boosting on very large uh, data set on a cluster. And this is not implemented in scikit-learn, uh, but that could be uh, something that we could implement in collaboration with the Dask project as an extension to Scikit-Learn. Uh, that would be actually a very in interesting project to do uh, for our students, for instance, because it's an interesting algorithm. Uh, but it's, it won't be part directly of Scikit-Learn because Scikit-Learn has no dependency on cluster management system. Thank you, Olivia. Well, thank you. Uh, okay. Thanks.